Hello, everyone. Welcome to Megger's monthly webinar series. Today's topic is practical applications of VLF testing. And in this session, we'll be discussing the practical applications of very low frequency 10 delta and with cable systems. My name is Yerto. I'm the marketing engineer for Mega North America, and I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation. I will be supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter during the session. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions during the Q&A segments. You will you will receive a copy of the presentation afterwards and a link to the recorded session if you want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. Remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation and I will interject them as we have time. Our presenter today is Jason Sauchek, Application Engineer for Cable Products. Jason is based out of our Dallas office in Texas. Thank you for joining us, Jason. Thank you for having me here. Um, just to start here, we're we're going to go over the scope of what we are here. So we're going to cover basically our field, the, the bulk of it, voltage levels, the test duration, the test standards that we're testing to. And we will also talk a little bit about monitor with, monitored withstand testing. Uh, in addition to this, we'll talk about how to size a test set. Why do I need a certain size? Uh, what are the parameters that go in with that? And just as a... a nod to last month's webinar, uh, we'll not cover partial discharge and 10 delta testing in depth here. We'll mention it a little bit, uh, but we covered that in depth last month with our webinar from Henning Ocean, and that is available uh, as a recording. So to get started, we'll talk, here's the agenda, talk a little bit about the cables and take a, a very high level view of the why, when, and what of VLF. Talk very briefly about the historical uh, backgrounds uh, we'll talk a little bit about the aging conditions, what we're actually trying to, to detect with our VLF testing, and then we'll spend a lot of time talking about modern withstand testing. So as a review, uh, just so we're all on the same page, we'll talk very briefly about the parts of a cable. Uh, we start, of course, with the conductor, the current carrying component. It's typically aluminum or copper, uh, maybe stranded or solid. Uh, following that, is a, a thin layer of semiconductive material. This is often overlooked, but it serves a very important role. Uh, in cables that are particularly stranded cables, we have peaks and valleys in the, uh, in the outer radius of the cable, and they can create very severe voltage gradients. So this semiconductive layer helps smooth those out and provides a nice smooth transition into the bulk insulation. Of course, the bulk insulation is there to hold the voltage back. Uh, it's typically EPR, XLPE, or there are many other kinds of insulation out there. After the bulk insulation is the same semiconductive material to provide a nice smooth transition in voltage out of the bulk insulation and onto the metallic screen layer. Finally, we have another often overlooked layer of the outer jacket. Primarily, that's there for mechanical and moisture protection. So what kind of cables are we going to talk about here? Uh, most commonly, we'll see EPR, XLPE, or PILC type cables. Uh, EPR and XLPE, we very often lump together in a, a term called extruded cables or solid dielectric cables. That's because the, the bulk insulation material is solid. Uh, the EPR maybe feels a bit like a pencil eraser uh, the XLPE feels a little bit more plasticky. The pill cable we treat a little bit differently often uh, because the insulation material is of a different nature. It's paper wrapped around the center conductor and then filled with oil. And the paper provides a structure to the cable, but the oil is actually providing the... These can come in single phase or many different types of three phase varieties. What do I mean by aging? All cables have some kind of life. Uh, often you'll hear terms of 30, 40 years uh, as an expected life of a cable. Things like thermal stress, electrical stress, mechanical stress, and environmental stress can all reduce the life expectancy of a cable. Uh, thermal stress can come from overloading the cable, pushing too much current through it, 
Electrical stress can come from over-voltaging the cable, for example, or regions of high uh, voltage stress. Mechanical stress is, they can come from nicks and scratches in the jacket as the cable is being pulled in and installed. It can also come from over-bending the cable, exceeding the bend radius of the cable. When the cable is then returned to a, a, a being straight, sometimes you get air bubbles. The, the layers, the various layers in the cables will delaminate and you'll get air bubbles and that'll create a, a cable failure at that point. An environmental, typically wet conditions do contribute to a reduced cable life. So why are we even testing here? Ultimately, the goal here is to increase the reliability of the system. We're reducing the number of unplanned outages, increasing our safety index, and we're able to proactively repair and replace questionable cables. We can do some preventative maintenance. Uh, we can ensure that there's no defects in manufacturing or workmanship. We can prevent the fault from even occurring in the first place. Or we can predict that the cable's about to fail by doing some preventative maintenance. We're trying to catch these aging before we suffer an in-service fault. So when do we test? Uh, IEEE, and the standard here is 400.2, lists three occasions when we test. And that's the installation test. That's basically a delivery test. Ensure there's no damage uh, from shipping. There's an acceptance test. That's a test upon completion of work. So the cable's all done, but before we energize it. Uh, these would be fall under the preventative maintenance. We're trying to pull out these faults before we energize the cable. And finally, we have our maintenance test schedule. This is somewhat reduced voltage level, and it's a regularly scheduled check of the cables, typically every three to five years. One that falls outside of the, the standard is, uh, that people do often is after repair test. Uh, there's no standard for this, but oftentimes it's about a five minute voltage pressure chest, uh, check just to make sure that the cable's not gonna fail as soon as you put it back in service. So, oh, what is VLF? Fundamentally, it's an AC over voltage test or an AC high pot. It's performed at 0 0.1 hertz. So it's like a pressure test. We're going to apply a voltage above operating voltage, and those voltages are all listed in IEEE standard 400.2, and we're gonna look for a breakdown. The cable will either survive the test, it'll pass the test and not break down, or it'll break down. So it's a simple pass-fail uh, kind of result. This does provide us limited diagnostic information, uh, but we can use VLF technologies. Uh, we can add some measurements and then do partial discharge diagnostics or 10 delta diagnostics with the same basic waveform, with the same basic power supply. So. Historically, or for many, many years, DC test sets were used. Uh, they were small, light, portable, inexpensive. It checked really all the boxes. Uh, but the cables at the time were laminated pilt cables. And because of the oil in the cables, uh, they're different than the extruded cables. The extruded cables develop a trapped space charge. If there's any kind of imperfection in the insulation, a, a small speck of dirt, a small air void, anything along those lines, uh, the electrons that are moving in one direction with the DC test, they'll gather at that imperfection. And that creates a region of high voltage stress and that'll eventually cause a cable failure. We don't see this problem with pill cables because the oil moves around and the, the electrons can't gather in one place. So due to the trapped space charges, we find that the cables actually have a reduced life expectancy. And there's an EPRI report uh, test number on the screen here if you want to look that up. Additionally, so DC hertz are solid dielectric cables. It's also blind to certain defects in both kinds of cables, so both extruded cables and pilt cables. And what do I mean by blind to certain defects? Uh, these gentlemen published a paper here where they tested both AC and DC uh, pretty severe. They drove a, a needle partway through the insulation and grounded it. So it's not a complete short, but it's, it's a pretty severe defect by anybody's definition. 
And what they found was that AC was 100% effective at finding this fault, and DC was 0%. And there's the, the numbers on the screen there. Not only was DC ineffective at finding this fault, DC was ineffective at finding it at much, much higher voltages, 8 and 10 times operating voltage, compared to AC finding it at about 3 times operating voltage. So VLF is much more effective at finding these faults at much lower voltages. And this is true for extruded cables, which is on the left here, and also uh, pilt cables, which is on the right. The only difference in their test setup was that for the pilt cables, they drilled a hole and filled it with water. But it was the same, same ultimate results. DC was 0%, AC was 100%. And finally, there is no DC standard, or no IEEE standard for DC testing on extruded cables. Uh, IEEE 400.1 exists, which is DC guidelines for testing on laminated power cable systems. And they go out of their way to specify pilk, paper insulated, lead covered, pipe type, or in general, laminated cable systems. Uh, so at the moment, no standard or guide exists for, uh, no IEEE standard exists for DC testing. We have to use. Well, the only alternative here is AC. And we can use 50 or 60 hertz power frequency, or we can use our 0.1 hertz VLF. In an ideal world, we would use 50 or 60 hertz. That's what the cable sees in real life. That's what it uh, would be the most realistic test. However, if we go to VLF frequencies, 0.1, we get a huge advantage in the power required to charge this cable. In fact, the difference between 60 hertz and 0.1 hertz is 600 times less power. Uh, this allows for practical... Uh, so I have some examples here with some numbers. Basically, uh, the top one here is a 1,000-foot piece of 15 kV cable. Uh, if we try to test it at 60 hertz, we need almost 10,000 watts <laughs> or 10,000 volt amps to charge this cable. Compare that to VLF, uh, where we need less than 20 volt amps or 20 watts. So we get a huge, huge advantage in power savings. And it's the difference between driving a, a truck to the, to the cable or being able to pick up a piece of test equipment. The second example is a similar idea. It's just a longer piece of cable. And we see even more uh, dramatic power savings. So the VLF values, they come from IEEE 400.2. Uh, it lists voltages for many uh, voltage classes of cable from 5 kV up to 69 kV, and it breaks them up into the installation, acceptance, and maintenance test values. So, with that in mind, how do we size a VLF unit? Well, of course, you have to get one that reaches the voltage required based on IEEE 400.2. That's a given. But in addition to that, we also have to make sure that our VLF test set is powerful enough to charge these cables. So even though it's much less power, 20 watts or 300 watts or so, depending on the size of the cable, um, we have to make sure that we can charge that. And the capacitance of the cable varies voltage class and insulation material. In general, as a general trend, higher conductor sizes and a lower voltage class results in a higher capacitance per, per length. Uh, I have some example numbers here. It's impossible to give you a number for your cable because they're all a little bit different, uh, but these are just some general numbers for XLPE type cables. And we can see here that as the conductor size increases, the capacitance increases, but as the voltage class increases, the capacitance uh, per mile decreases. Jason, uh, before we move on, uh, can we feel a couple of questions from the audience? So Kushal wants to know that since the frequency is so low at 0 0.1 hertz, does it mean this is equivalent to a DC high pot test? That's a great question. Uh, no, 0 0.1 hertz uh, is a very much an AC high pot. It's just very slow. We switch frequencies. We switch from a fully positive uh, peak to a fully negative peak in five seconds. And it also, if you think about what the electrons are doing, they're getting pushed into and out of the insulation material 
every five seconds or ten seconds, depending on your perspective of it. So no, there is an oscillation just like an AC voltage source. Okay. Okay, there's another question came in. So when would you select VLF testing uh, instead of DC high pot for medium voltage? Uh, basically, for medium voltage cables, the only time DC is still acceptable is for PILT cables. That's uh, the only time IEEE has a, a standard for it. So if you're testing on EPR or XLPE, you're going, you really want to be using uh, VLF. Uh, other than that, you know, maybe there's some practical considerations. You only have a DC test set available or something, but as far as standards go, you're really looking at VLF anymore. Uh, okay, maybe one last question because it involves the table that was just shown. So looking at the table on your previous slide, um, with voltage and cable size, what um, what about the length of the cable? Yeah, those uh, those numbers were given per mile. So if you have a longer cable, uh, if you have two miles, you double them, or if you have a shorter cable, half mile, you cut them in half. Okay. Let's uh, move on. Uh, what are the aging conditions we keep talking about? Primarily what we're really talking about are water trees. Uh, almost every cable will develop them. Some are more susceptible than others. And I know that the cable manufacturers have been hard at work developing better and better technologies to avoid this issue. Uh, we have two basic kinds of water trees that we'll, we'll be talking about. We can kind of classify them into two groups. In the lower left of the screen, we have small distributed water trees. Uh, these are an issue, but they're not necessarily a critical issue. On the lower right, we have one very large tree, and those are the ones that we're really concerned about. They're the ones that can cause us problems in the very short uh, future here. So what happens with these water trees is that they disrupt the nice even field strengths that these cables are designed with. In a perfectly good cable, we have radially symmetric field strengths uh, throughout the entire cable. But when the water tree starts to grow, it disrupts this field strength. And it can at the tip of the, the water tree, that's very, very high voltage stress. And if that voltage stress exceeds the uh, capabilities of the insulation, uh, then we form what's called a electrical tree. And we can see on this picture here a very visual difference between what a water tree and an electrical tree would look like. Water trees are pretty dense and generally straight. The electrical trees are much sparser and uh, much more random in their uh, paths. The other critical difference here is that water trees tend to be poor insulators. So if you can imagine that these Cable manufacturers have spent a lot of time and energy developing the best insulation material they could, and if we introduce water into this, that can only make the insulation worse. Uh, so water trees are poor insulators compared to electrical trees, which are actually pretty good conductors. So there's a, a subtle but important difference there. And the conductivity of the electrical trees comes from the deposited on the outer edges of the channel. Once the electrical tree bridges enough of the insulation, that cable faults, and now we have to go repair it. So water trees can come in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, we have some different examples here. We have some small ones uh, distributed throughout the, the insulation, and those generally aren't a critical concern at the you know, in day-to-day -day life. Uh, at the 9 o'clock position on the picture, we have a critical size water tree. This one has grown to the point where that, that voltage stress is so high that it's in danger of uh, growing an electrical tree at any, any moment. And once that happens, uh, the cable fails in a in matter of hours or so. The water trees take a very long time to grow, uh, 5, 10, 20 years, somewhere in that order. Uh, but electrical trees, once they form, they'll fail a cable in a number of hours. So. When we talk about modern withstand testing, when we talk about VLF testing, what, is, what are the parameters uh, that we're testing to, and what is actually happening during the test? So, VLF testing is an AC voltage 
at 0 0.1 hertz. It's, the voltage is going to be selected based on the IEEE standards, but it's going to be a voltage above rated voltage. And the idea here is to put pressure on the cable to find the weak spots. BLF testing is a check <clears throat> of the overall integrity of the cable system. And it, VLF testing in itself, just VLF with sand testing, results in a pass-fail test. Later on, um, we can add more diagnostic information from it, but in its basic form, VLF testing is a pass-fail test. And the goal of this testing is to detect local weak spots in the insulation. And we find those weak spots by causing existing weak spots to fail during our test time. Uh, we cause them to fail during our scheduled test time. We've already scheduled this outage, and we fail them during conditions. So what do I mean by local issues? We can have local issues in terminations caused by workmanship. Uh, we can have global issues of these small distributed uh, non-critical water trees. Those are really not the ones we're targeting. Nuts uh, or splices caused by workmanship issues typically or possibly manufacturing defects. But um, And we can also have critically sized water trees the overall cable length. So VLF testing then is for these local issues. We're really not targeting those distributed water trees. Those small ones uh, are not an issue yet. We're going to wait until they grow to a critical size. So the goal of VLF testing then is to improve the reliability of the system by accelerating existing weak spots to failure during our scheduled outage, under controlled test conditions, and critically at reduced energy levels. So we just talked about VLF testing requires a few hundred watts at most uh, compared to a in-service fault. The amount of energy that you would uh, experience during a in-service fault is, is incredibly much less energy. So by using this reduced energy levels we can limit collateral damage and therefore restoration time. We are able we may be able to find a fault in a single phase during our test time that if it were to fail during in-service, it would have taken out all three phases and very much increased our repair time. We're also able to repair and replace these cables on a planned or proactive basis. Uh, instead of being unplanned and reactive and responsive to faults, we can go out and choose the time uh, that we want, want to find these problems. So I hear you guys saying faults. You know, I don't want faults in my cable. Well, VLF accelerates the aging conditions of existing weak spots, and it causes them to fail in during your testing time. Of course, choosing the time my random in-service failure. Um, Everybody is well familiar, I think, with Murphy's law, and if we let our random service failures just happen. You know, chances are it's going to be at 2 a.m. on a Thursday in some rainy or snowy night. Um, I, I would much prefer to have that uh, fail during a nice sunny Tuesday morning. Additionally, VLF does not cause problems on the cable system. And there's a NETRAC report out there. There's a number on the, the screen here. And I've quoted some of their lines from it, some of their findings. Um, I particularly like this last one here. It seems reasonable to conclude that the current levels of voltage and time recommended by IEEE standard 400.2 are reasonable at finding defects in a wide range of utility cable systems and do not pose an unreasonably high failure risk for cable systems either during tests or afterwards. Basically they age cables for a number of simulated years. Uh, they have and when they did the VLF test, they found no correlation with cables that had been VLF tested versus those that hadn't in the number of faults. So VLF testing does not put faults on cable, but what it does is cause them to fail at a more convenient time uh, and therefore avoiding unplanned outages. So what do we mean by critical trees? In Almost all cable systems, there's going to be some small, non-threatening trees. Uh, the exception might be newer cable systems. Five and ten years old may not have this, but the age systems typically do find some amount of tree. Uh, 
there's also some imaginary point in there that's a critical point, and I represented it here by a, a blue line. When these trees grow past this critical point, they're in danger of failing in service. They can fail at any time. They can create this electrical tree and cause a failure at any moment. What we do at VLF this critical point out, we put it deeper into the insulation so that we can find these medium-sized water trees, these ones that are going to grow to failure in the next couple of years, and we can cause them to fail during our test time. Uh, one at the 9 o'clock position hadn't failed yet. Of course, we'll find that one. But also this one that's not critical yet, it'll cross a critical line in a year or two. We can cause that to fail during our scheduled test time when we have people and material available to us to fix this. Um, and we're not targeting these small water trees. These smaller ones are very likely, based on the, the rate of growth, they're very likely to be okay until the next scheduled test. And VLF does not cause those to grow at all. Uh, this is a symmetrical um, process. Water trees grow from the outside in just, just as much as they grow from the inside out. So there is a critical point on the outer side as well. And for example, there's a, there's a picture of a water in danger of failing in service. So what happens here? What are the results? Well, the cable can pass. It can hold voltage for the required time without breakdown. And based on a report from Dortmund, which is a city in Germany, and their 20 years of experience with VLF testing, if a cable passes VLF uh, testing, statistically it's about 97% reliable for over two years. So they find 97% of their faults for the next two years during their test time. If the cable doesn't pass, well then it, it breaks down and we now have a faulted cable and we have to repair it or bypass it. And with that in mind, we should have on standby some CFL equipment, uh, spare cable, splice kits, things like that, or backup cable. Some alternative plan to keep customers in service while we repair this cable. So that's what we're trying to do with this VLF testing. Then we'll get into the parameters of the tests and what we're looking at with these. So we have four parameters here, frequency, voltage, waveform, and test time. The frequency and waveform, that's typically dictated by the equipment you get. Um, they're going to be 0 0.1 hertz um, and either sinusoidal or cosine rectangular uh, pieces of equipment. So that's a decision you make once and then uh, that's it. The voltage level and test time, that's the, the kind of information that you need to know at the time of the test. And it's going to be based on where the cable is in its lifespan. So frequency, if you're testing the IEC standards, it only recognizes 0 0.1 hertz. If you're testing the IEEE standards, they highly, highly recommend 0 0.1 hertz. However, they do allow you to use lower frequencies. We go from a one-hour test to a 10-hour test, or similarly for other uh, factors like that. Uh, they do caution that results at lower frequency may not result in the same uh, same results. They may not be comparable because of a lower uh, dVdt or change in voltage over time. Uh, you wind up with significantly less stress, and there's a little bit less data to compare to. And there's a, a quote from the IEEE uh, standard just to that effect. So 0 0.1 hertz is the frequency and now we can choose either sinusoidal or cosine rectangular. Both are recognized by IEEE and they have charts for both waveforms. So I think most commonly uh, sinusoidal waveforms are, are widely available and we also use the sinusoidal waveform for tandem. Everybody's familiar with the sinusoidal wave. It's a nice smooth uh, transition positive and to negative and um, 
nice smooth voltage transition. This other waveform, this cosine rectangular, is a little bit um, less common, uh, but cosine rectangular units tend to have a higher testing capacity uh, size for size. Uh, we cannot use it for tan delta testing, uh, but because of the, the nature of the wave and how fast it switches from positive to negative polarity, it results in a higher uh, change in voltage over time, results in a higher voltage stress, and it gives us a better reading in partial discharge. Uh, it also tends to cause these defects, these latent defects in the cable, the ones that we're targeting, it tends to cause those to fail quicker. So, a little bit of a zoom in here on the cosine rectangular. It is a 0 0.1 hertz VLF uh, frequency, but at the transition from the positive to the negative periods, we shape the waveform in such a way to mimic power frequency. So based on the capacitance of the cable, that can switch in about 8 to 10 milliseconds or so. Um, very similar to the change in polarity of 50 or 60 hertz power frequency testing. So it's a much, it's VLF testing, we get the benefits of the lower power consumption, but we also keep the benefits of power frequency testing in the, the fast voltage uh, transition there. So those are the types of things, the frequency and the voltage shape that we tend to make at the time of purchasing the, the VLF test set. When we're actually at the cable, we have to decide what voltage level we'll test to and for how long. So IEEE has three voltage levels, uh, depending on where it is in its life. Uh, the installation test, and that's basically a delivery check. Um, when the truck pulls up, this can be done with the cables on the reel still. Uh, Truck pulls up, you're just looking for damage during shipping or from more than once now trading stories with different customers. I've heard um, where a truck driver would staple the bill of lading right directly to the cable. And then I have two little fang marks in there that are going to cause you trouble down the line. But a VLF installation test is very likely to detect something like that. For acceptance testing, uh, many times, not always, but many times people do skip the installation test it's, um, because the acceptance test should always follow that. The acceptance test is a higher voltage than the installation test, and it's performed when all the work is done on the cable. All the splices are done, all the terminations are done, um, the cable's still isolated from the, the rest of the switch gear, but otherwise uh, the work on the cable is complete. And what we're looking for here is still any transportation or manufacturer defects, uh, but primarily workmanship issues in joints and terminations. Um, and this will be, or should be, this voltage level this cable ever sees its life. Uh, if you look on the next column here, is the that's typically on about 70 to 80 percent of the acceptance test. And we do the maintenance tests when the cable's already in service, and instead of looking for workmanship issues, we're now looking for aging conditions. You know, obviously it's a brand new piece of cable, there's not going to be any aging conditions on it, uh, but as the cable ages, those water trees grow, and that's what we're looking for. And the, this is the lowest voltage level of the pressure tests. So a little bit closer look at the a segment of the IEEE 400.2 table, and it's table three. Um, it's very easy to read. It's a matter of selecting the waveform that you're going to be using, and that's dictated by your equipment again. Once you select the waveform, you select the voltage rating of your system. In this case, let's take an example of a sinusoidal 5 kV cable. And then you decide if you're doing the installation test. If you're done uh, putting the splices and terminations on but haven't yet put this cable in service, you're going to do an acceptance test. If the cable's been in service for a number of years, you're doing the maintenance test. And in general, the maintenance test values are about 70 to 80 percent of the acceptance test values. But IEEE has this chart everywhere from 5 kV to 69 kV. Oh, okay. Before we move on again, uh, a couple of quick questions from the audience. Um, at what cable age should we start implementing VLF testing? 
very good question. Um, there are some standards out there. Uh, I believe NIDA and some of the manufacturer standards recognize DC testing up until about five years of the cable's life. Uh, after that, DC test standards. However, there's at no time in the cable's life can you to say you can use VLF the entire life of the cable compared to the limit of five years on DC testing. Now, if you're asking when it goes from a new installation to a uh, or goes from an acceptance test value to a maintenance test value, um, typically you do the maintenance tests and put the cable in service, and you don't come out and touch it again. Uh, if you're out there and things are failing on you, well, that's that's an abnormal condition, and you have to make that determination. But after you know three to five years, you're going to start looking at the the maintenance test values exclusively. Okay, and is there any difference between a 50, 60 hertz with then test and the VLF test in the, in terms of accelerating aging conditions? Um, yes, there is. Is at the but at the voltage levels we're talking about about two times operating voltage for the maintenance test values. Uh, it turns out that 50, 60 hertz is actually very similar in terms of growing the water trees, growing the electric VLF. Uh, as you vary that in voltage, if you go uh, less than that or more than that, there becomes a little bit of a difference. Uh, but at our at our target voltages, they're actually very similar. Okay, and the last question, um, if you compare VLF testing with DC high pot testing, is it still considered a destructive test? So, yeah, it's an over-voltage test. I know uh, NIDA has their, uh, has the explanations of type 1 and type 2 and destructive, non-destructive. Um, I want to be very careful with how I uh, use the word destructive. Uh, VLF does not put problems on your cable uh, based on knee track research and things like that. But if there are problems on the cable, it will cause your cable to fail. And that's the goal of VLF testing. That's what it's designed to do. So in that sense, it is destructive, but only if there's a problem on the cable. It's not going to cause additional problems. Okay. Um... So we just decided on what type of test we're doing, whether we're insulation testing, acceptance testing, or maintenance testing. And the final thing we have to decide on here is test time. So based on the IEEE standard, they recommend 30 to 60 minute tests. Um, based on the 20 years of experience from this uh, Dortmund uh, report, uh, they find that they find about 75% of their faults on age cables they find about 75% of their defects in the first 30 minutes. But if they extend it out to the second 30 minutes, they find 5% of their faults. So um, for age cables, it's often a very good idea to run for the full 60 minutes because these aging cables they take some time to grow. It doesn't happen instantaneously. Um, First, you have to grow the water tree a little bit. Then it has to convert over to an electrical tree. And then that electrical tree has to grow through the insulation. So it takes a little bit of work to start this process and then abort the test early or stop the test early and put this cable back into service. That will result in an in-service fault, and that's exactly the thing we're trying to avoid. So the best it's a very good idea then to run these tests for a minimum of 30 minutes, and if we want to be get the last 25% of our faults, get that last little bit of reliability. We're already there. We're already switched out. We can run it for another 30 minutes to bring the test time up to 60 minutes. Uh, this is specific to age cables for your maintenance test values. Um, for acceptance testing, typically you do see things fail a little bit quicker. So 30-minute tests are off. There's no harm done to the cable by running an acceptance test for 60 minutes either. So that pretty much covers the VLF withstand testing, these pass fail test. It very much is the modern equivalent of a DC high pot. Here about monitored withstand test. Uh, what that is is a combination test. We take the parameters from the withstand test, so the frequency, 
the waveform, the voltage level, and the time, they all stay exactly the same. Um, but what we do is add the measurements from tan delta. And a report might look like this, where we have this sinusoidal wave. And we take a tan delta reading. And what that does is it allows us to monitor what's happening with the withstand test. It's more than a go, no go test. Failure from these increasing tan delta readings. Very similar to running a DC high pot and watching for increasing leakage current, we can run this monitored VLF withstand test and watch for increasing tan delta tests. There's no standard for this, but uh, if we're able to start seeing these tan delta readings taking off, we are able to abort the test before the cable fail, uh, fails. At this point, we have to make a decision. We may cable to service, uh, there, but at an increased risk of failure. We know that this cable has not passed the test. We know that this cable is not good. Uh, so why would I choose to do this? Well, maybe uh, I don't have materials available, or I ran out of splice kits, or something along those lines. Uh, that would be a, a good reason for why I would abort the test. Um, we can do the test, come back, and cause this cable to finish this test at a more convenient time, or when I've arranged for materials or personnel or cable fault equipment to, to be available. So, in summary then, basic VLF withstand test just gathers basic information about the cables. It's able to weed out bad cables uh, and also able to weed out weak spots by growing these electrical trees to failure. What it cannot tell you though is how well the cable is. Did it pass, did it just barely pass the test? Or did, is it very strong and pass the test very easily? It can't tell you if the cable is experiencing high losses uh, or if there's a significant amount of water trees in there. Additionally, it doesn't localize the defects. The only way to find these weak spots is to cause the cable to fail and then use our cable fault equipment. So if the withstand test doesn't provide the information on the insulation condition, what are the alternatives? What tests do I need to run? And that's when we're going to talk about the diagnostic tests, tan delta and partial discharge diagnostics. And tan delta is good at global assessments, looking at the overall condition of the cable insulation. Partial discharge is good at looking at local issues, problems in splices and terminations typically. So I'll again point you towards the webinar from last month from Henning Ocean. Uh, should be recorded and available for everybody to look, and that's where we got into some of these diagnostic questions. So, thank you very much for your time, and I think we have some questions. All right, thank you. The webinar is officially concluded, but we will stay online for another 30 minutes to um, give an extended Q&A based on last year's um, uh, feedback. So for those of you who have any questions, please type them in the chat box now. And for those of you that are leaving, uh, when you close the webinar, a survey should pop up uh, on your screen. And we will greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so that we can continue to improve future webinars. Um, a copy of the presentation will be emailed to you in the next couple of days. And then in the next two weeks, we will post the recording um, on our website at mega.com slash webinars. So let's go to the questions. Um, okay, so um, is it leakage current that we're measuring? If yes, then what is the limit? So it's not exactly leakage current. Leakage current is uh, particular to DC, but related to it. Uh, when we're doing these tan delta measurements, we're looking at the ratio of capacitive current to resistive current. And as the cable starts to age and fail, the resistive current component gets larger and larger, and that increases the tan delta number. Uh, so when you're doing these monitored with stand tests, there's no stand so I can't tell you what the limit is, um, but I think it's pretty obvious as you're doing the test that this cable is is failing. The the water trees are really 
starting to grow, start, uh, it'll be pretty obvious from the data that you're having a problem. Um, what is the pass PLF test? Uh, so the pass fail criteria is very straightforward. It's either the cable holds the, the voltage or it breaks down. And the test sets are typically able to find that short circuit current. They're able to detect that. And at that point, they'll usually turn themselves off. Some, uh, some have different options on that, but usually they'll turn themselves off and say that the test has failed. Um, is it acceptable to test multiple phases at the same time with jumpers? Uh, yes, it is acceptable to do that. Uh, just have to pay attention to the capacitance of the cables. Um, if your cables are only a couple hundred feet long, it's very likely that you'll have no problem. But if you start talking about cables that are a couple miles long, you may need either a bigger test set or to test them phase by phase. Or um, we can do three-phase test sets, too. They, those things exist as well. Um, can the VLF test be used as a high part for other equipment like breakers or bushings and things like that? So it's my understanding that the answer to that question is yes, although I, I'm not familiar with those standards. Uh, I believe they exist, um, but I, I can't direct you towards which standard it would be. All right, should the test voltage be gradually increased to a specified level, or do we just go straight to the full test voltage? Um, there's, I don't usually see people going step by step through that. Um, yeah, the, the test set requires a little bit of time to ramp up anyways just to charge the cable. And if you're using a sinusoidal wave, it's crossing from zero to peak, you know, every test anyways. So I don't see any, any for the, uh, for a, a dedicated step voltage. Can you explain the installation test values versus the acceptance test values? Um, I don't know about explain, but um, the difference between those two tests is that the installation test is really checking the cable itself, just a cable in and of itself. Um, it can be done on the reel or maybe if you're in an open trench once it's laid in the trench, something like that. Um, the acceptance test value is testing everything, assessing the entire cable system. So that includes splices and terminations, as well as the, the cable. Um, I think your question is kind of alluding to the reason some people choose to skip the installation test because the acceptance test will should, if you're doing things correctly, should always follow it, and that's a higher voltage level. So if it passes the acceptance test, it would very much have passed the installation test. Um, it just may be information on when and where the, the problems in the cable occurred. Um, for cables that are installed within metal conduits, are there any special considerations that we have to take into account when performing VLF testing? Uh, as long as the cable is shielded, the, the shield is uh, held at ground potential anyways, and the, the metal, uh, I'm sure you guys have, with any utilities that are using metal conduits, they, they've definitely done uh, DC high pots or at least thumping on their cables, and they're well aware of any special safety considerations, but in general it should be at ground potential anyways, and I'm not aware of any special considerations for metal cables. So once the test has failed, how do you pinpoint the exact location of the failure? Okay, so once, uh, so the goal of VLF testing is, of course, to find these weak spots and cause them to fail. Uh, 
the weakness, so to speak, of this test set is it, by itself it can't tell you where the, the fault occurred. Uh, for that, we have to go to our cable fault locating equipment, so that's thumpers or bridges or things of that nature, uh, to find out where the fault location is. Um, depending on your system, you may use uh, sectionalizing tools or things of, of that nature, but we're going to go into cable fault location mode at that point. On one of your diagrams, you show a water tree growing from the inside out, so how does this happen? Um, that's a very good question for a cable manufacturer, I think. Um, I don't know all the mechanisms of how it... Uh, sure. Uh, I don't know all the, the, all the mechanisms of how that can happen, but any, any way that water can get into the... the um, or it's laying in water, things of that nature. Uh, I know cable manufacturers now fill the stranded conductors. You know, in the past, they were they didn't fill them with, with anything. They left them basically air filled. Um, but now they put some kind of special uh, material in there to absorb and stop the water from passing through. So it it does happen. Um, what would you advise for testing of 5 kV non-shielded cables? So these are typically used in Canada. So unshielded cables uh, present a bit of a, a difficulty uh, because you don't have that concentric shield around it. Uh, you don't have a, a nice even voltage stress. Um, the IEEE standard is written for shielded cables. Um, the only thing you can really do for unshielded cables sound. And as far as that goes, um, yeah. uh, testing to ground or phase to phase if there's multiple conductors there. Um, I'm not sure of what standards exist for that, um, but I imagine that the IEEE number should be at least a guideline for you to go through with that. Um. How do you see utilities use, utilizing VLF uh, in the future? I think uh, utilities are just, in general, switching off of DC testing based on the, the research that's been done. Um, they don't want to harm their cables, um, and they do want to find the defects. If, they're, if the utility is going to institute this cable testing program, they want it to be effective, so they're going to VLF. Um, most of the time, what I see with utilities is if they're going to institute this program, they're very keen to get on TAN-Delta as well. So um, VLF withstands are there, but they're very often doing TAN-Delta as well uh, with its advantages. Um, I've seen partial discharge used to test rotating equipment. Is VLF monitored, VLF limited to testing cables only? So, uh, like the other question, there are uh, standards out there for VLF testing of various different uh, pieces of equipment. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head what those standards are, but um, you can test them for things like vacuum bottles and switch gear and circuit breakers, um, rotating machineries, things like that, as long as the test set is able to, to charge the, the capacitance of the, the device. Um, so, when we are selecting between, I guess, sine wave and cosine rectangular waveform, what, um, when or why should we pick one over the other? It depends on the type of test, the other types of tests you want to do. Yeah. Uh, with sine wave, you can do 10 delta testing as well. Uh, it's it's required for tan delta testing. Uh, with the cosine rectangular, it's because of that fast voltage switch there. Because of the how quickly it switches from positive to negative, it gives us a better partial discharge result. So for basic withstand testing, uh, there's very little reason to go with one over the other. Uh, cosine rectangular tends to have more testable capacitance to it. You can test longer cables with it. 
but if that's not a factor, if your your runs are short, then there, there's little little need to go to one or the other. Okay. Um, is the VLS test uh, recommended for EPR cables? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all of these numbers in IEEE 400.2, uh, they're applicable for basically, and you, it goes by the rating of the cable system and not the installation type. Uh, Tandelta gets into a little bit more detail with the installation type, but this basic withstand testing is it's all the same. Um, what voltage should you use if part of your cable is old and part of your cable is new? Yeah, this is uh, a question many, many utilities are struggling with. Um, most of them will choose to go with the lower maintenance value because unless you can separate out the, the old piece of cable in some way, uh, you risk overstressing that old piece of cable if you use the, the new values. It's it's kind of a, a risk management sort of uh, strategy there. The expectation is that it should be okay, um, but on old cables, you know that there could very well be problems there. So, it's when you're putting in new cables, it's very rare, very very rare to find problems in the cable itself. Uh, for new installations, the problems generally occur with the splices, or if you're redoing the terminations in that, and uh, for something like that, depending on your application, partial discharge may be an option to check the, the workmanship on the splices. We're, we're getting a number of questions here about finding the fault after the, the withstand test. And the the answer is that's thunders and TDRs and things like that. Um, the the VLF withstand test by itself can't tell you where the, the fault occurred. It, yeah, the, when the the cable fails, it, it puts a pinhole fault in the cable, um, so the conductor will be intact, uh, but there'll be a hole through the insulation that means that it can't carry the rated voltage and our thumpers and other various other yeah various other cable fault equipment is all designed to find exactly that condition maybe one final question so is it a good idea to do a quick insulation resistance test with the DC test set at nominal voltage before going to VLF testing? Uh, but the insulation resistance test, uh, if you're going to take, a, say, a 5 kV piece of equipment out, that's okay. That's, that's a wise uh, way to go. Not everybody does it, and that's also good. Um, but the, the, the reason that's okay is that the insulation resistance test is very short. It's maybe a minute, and that's not going to put any problems on the cable. Uh, but what you can find with it is uh, you can go out there and do your insulation resistance test and find that you already have a problem on the, the cable and that saves you time or it could potentially save you time on even bothering to VLF test this cable. Uh, for example, I've been talking to some utilities about uh, cable replacement strategies and basically they know these cables are bad. They're 40 years old and they, they know that they're bad and they're just trying to find out which ones they need to replace and their first step is to go out and hit it with a, a insulation resistance test and the ones that just straight up test bad, they'll put them back in service but they'll go to the top of the list for, for replacement so there, there is some value to doing that. Um, okay, it looks like this is all we have time for and the questions we are getting uh, are really for specific applications or equipment based and I think it's better to take these questions offline with you. So we'll get uh, our tech support group to get in touch with you if we haven't answered your question on the air. Um, 
thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see you again at our next webinar. Have a great weekend and please remember to answer the survey at the end of this. Um, okay.